This is a production of Cornell University. What I'm going to talk about today, the, the sources of uncertainty and future climate change projections. And um, as some people would say, uh, maybe the sources of certainty also in, in climate change projections, that the, that the way that the scientific community is communicating what we know and we don't know um, may be leading um, some people to, uh, to um, delay or to pretend that that's why they're delaying is because of the uncertainty. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the sources of uncertainty are in, in future climate change projections here. Um, as uh, David said, I'm uh, um, trained in atmospheric science, but I do a lot of work that's uh, kind of a, a coupling um, in the Earth system, as I would call it. What I have here uh, on the background is actually a slide from the IPCC, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the IPCC to begin with. How many people don't know what the IPCC is? It's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, okay? So keep working on it until you can say it that fast, all right? And um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is set up by the UN Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization, okay? Meteorolo meteorological organizations have been um, organizing themselves and passing data for a while because weather, of course, goes across borders. And uh, this particular panel is a science-oriented panel, and what they do... Uh, is uh, put together assessments of the state of the science. An assessment is really a consensus document about what the state of the science is. There's nothing radical in an assessment report or that was a mistake. I mean, it's really very much a consensus. There's not very much new in there. There can't be anything new. It has to already have been published. Um, and so uh, I, I was the lead author in the um, working group one, which is the physical science part, um, during the last assessment report, AR5, the assessment report number five. And uh, one of the things that our, we were tasked with doing is going out and talking about what was in that report. And so um, they gave us these cute little slides with the background and everything. So that's what I'm going to use for some of this presentation. This is the group that was involved in the assessment report from the working group one. There were three different working groups. This was the first working group, which is on the physical science basis. You can see that there's about 250 of us who were involved in the writing of this document. And I used to carry them around, but now they're, they're too big. It's about 500 pages. It's you know, a good five pounds or something like that from each working group that's assessing the state of the science. And um, so all uh, 250 of us, um, gathered four times in the writing of this document, and there were, uh, let's see, well, the summary for policymaker was only 14,000 words, but there were 14 chapters and 55,000 review comments from experts. So the experts are anybody who considers themselves an expert, okay? So if you guys consider yourself an expert, you can sign up and review the next IPCC document as well. Um, and it, it's a multi-year process getting this done. So actually, I'm, I'm back here. That, that's me with that little circle there. But um, <laughs> so it, it's an international group putting these things together. And really, it's, it's a consensus document. There's, there's not anything radical in that. Um, the working group and the way the IPCC is, is put together is actually fairly disciplinary in a lot of ways. And that has pros and cons. So working group one is very much the physical science basis. A lot of atmospheric scientists, oceanographers, some paleoclimate people, a little bit of carbon cycle, a little bit of aerosols. But it's mostly physical climate people. The working group two is the impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation group. And that's a, a little bit of a less organized group, but it would include ecologists, public health people, uh, infrastructure impacts, um, and then vulnerabilities. So that would be a lot of social scientists from the human side, as well as uh, agriculture on that. Um, the working group three is the mitigation. So that's often the economists and engineers talking about what we can do to solve the problem. And um, so the, the documents are a little bit disciplinary. And I think there's some pros and cons to that in that it organizes each of the, the different documents to really be nice consensus documents. But sometimes there's not as much communication as you might like between the different parts. So um, I'm actually uh, just been chosen to be on a cross uh, how, do, how do they phrase this? It's, a, it's, it's across the, the working group structure 
to look at a special report on the 1.5 degree, the possibility of getting to 1.5 degree, what the costs are, what the um, benefits are. And so it's, a, it's actually across a working group structure. So sometimes they have special reports where they have physical scientists talk to engineers and economists. It's very strange. But, um, but some of these reports are some of the better reports. For example, the special report on extremes was a really nice report they put out a couple years ago. So uh, one of the things, one of the reasons I talk to you so much about the IPCC is I think you should try to look at some of their documents, especially the summer, summary for policymaker, because it really is a consensus document, and it's really just talking about what is climate change and what the impacts will be. And go to the primary literature and find out what a really very mainstream group of scientists think is going on. And I think it really uh, would help uh, clarify what, what we really do know and what we don't know about the whole problem. So last fall, this is from uh, September 4th, 2016, there was this New York Times um, front page. And I don't know how many of you actually get physically the New York Times anymore. We only get it on Sundays. But, um, but to have so much climate change on one front page was, it was pretty interesting. So at that point, the US and the China were going to uh, move ahead with uh, the climate accord and trying to reduce some of the um, CO2 emissions. And at the same time, there was some coastal flooding in the United States that um, some of that coastal flooding is, of course, associated with sea level rise, associated with the warming oceans. So this is a good one just talking about how important the IPCC, uh, the climate change is becoming and how relevant it's becoming. So um, uh, last time, uh, Professor Hess talked to you about what we know about climate change. Um, anthropogenic climate change is pretty well established. It's, it's really pretty, uh, it, you know, it's 19th century science to say that if you add CO2 to the, to the atmosphere, you're going to see warming. No one has disproven that in any way. And um, so we have a lot of certainty about what kind of impacts the accumulation of CO2 will have in the atmosphere. And um, what I uh, want to talk a little bit more about today is what, what we don't know, or what are the uncertainties, and what are the sources of those uncertainties. Um, and so this is, again, a, a slide from last time, just talking about how definite the language is getting, and, and more and more definite. The longer the time frame is that the temperatures are really high um, above the pre-industrial, the more data we have that we have perturbed the climate. So we don't need temperatures to keep going up. We, all we need is the temperatures to be above the pre-industrial to suggest that the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere is um, causing the, the warming. Um, one of the, the um, methods that we use, actually, to take a look at climate change is we, we use climate models. And I happen, um, in my background, I use the climate models a lot. And the climate models are basically weather prediction models um, that, uh, um, that we all know and love, or we see the results of every day in terms of the weather prediction, um, and then apply to a longer time period. And so um, one, one thing I'm not sure that people understand is that meteorology is a field that came out of weather prediction for for example, military um, efforts, OK? A lot of the United States departments were established during World War II. For example, the department I, was, I come from, the meteorology department at MIT, was one of the places where the Air Force produced a lot of the meteorologists. And um, the whole idea of weather prediction is really an important um, part of, of meteorology. And, and, in, um, and it comes out of. Uh, the, the wartime efforts. Uh, for example, the UK Met Office is actually still in the Ministry of Defense, okay? That um, meteorology is really often comes out of uh, war efforts, and the US Air Force has a, a lot of meteorologists. And what that does is it actually uh, changes the way meteorology is done, I would argue, and I'm not sure people appreciate that, that um, meteorologists verify every prediction they make. And they, they take a look at what they did last week to try to see how they're doing. And that has come over into to climate change. So I think that um, meteorologists are very honest about what they know and what they don't know. And um, some other fields that make projections might not always be quite as honest about um, verifying what their projections were. For example, 
um, whether or not there was going to be a real estate bubble popping in 2007 or the stock market going down in 2007. Um, some of the different disciplines do not go back and check and see why they made a mistake in those times, whereas the meteorology field is very much into verification. And, um, and uh, what, one of the things we do is with these climate models, we do uh, short-term predictions are the same models, basically, you do short-term predictions with, and then we do longer-term predictions as well. Now, there's some differences between short-term and long-term predictions, which I hope to get to. Um, I don't want to jump ahead. So, uh, uh, last time, um, Professor Hess talked about the differences in the, in the future and, and what kind of climate change we might be seeing. For example, uh, if we go ahead with one might call it business as usual. It's called RCP 8.5 here. Um, we might have a four degree globally averaged increase in temperature by 2100. Or if we do something like RCP 2.6, the lowest trajectory that we included in the last IPCC, where we're carbon neutral by 2070, we'd have a much smaller increase in temperature, only one degree increase in temperature there. But what was a little bit hidden in, in that slide that he presented is actually that you know, we're, there's some spread in how much we think the future temperatures might go up. Even if we're um, thinking about, for example, here we are at 2000. This is 1850, 2000, 2100, 2200, 2300. Global surface temperature is the vertical axis. At 2100, there, there's actually some spread in where we think climate may go. And so while we're certain that adding CO2 into the atmosphere is going to warm the planet, we're not quite certain how much it's going to warm the planet. So that's often what we're talking about in terms of uncertainty. And then it, it depends where we're talking about it, how much, how, how late, you know, how, how much more it'll increase in temperature. So let me ask you then, what, what do you think the sources of uncertainty are for anthropogenic projection, or the projections of anthropogenic climate change going into the future? Five or six sources of uncertainty. Yeah. Right, so he's saying whether or not we change the carbon emissions, which there's actually two points that he's um, pulling together there. One is whether or not we change our policies, okay, so we intend to change, and the second is whether we're successful at changing our carbon emissions. So I'm going to separate those two because we can put in policies and whether they're successful, that's something different. What else? This is a really, really important point. And what she said was, right now we just have a, a short length of time with a certain amount of emissions. And in the future, it's going to be a lot longer time period and a lot more emissions. OK? So this is the cause of a, quite a bit of the uncertainty. And we're going to get back to that. That's perfect. A couple of other points. Anybody else think of anything? Right, so, so I, I put that with the policies, with the, the mitigation, and that, that's a, a really important point, and how we go about it is, is going to matter. So the other part of, Right, I work a lot on aerosols, so he's, he's, he's answering the right way. So um, that there, it's not always that easy to get from emissions to how much it's changing the, the radiative balance of the planet. And aerosols are a case in point that is actually really difficult. And we don't understand quite aerosols and their interactions. So, so those are going to be kind of the questions that we're going to go over today um, in talking about uncertainty. Um, and let's see, what, what time exactly am I supposed to stop speaking? Can you tell me? Yeah, I want more than five. I've got a clock right there. What's the, what's the time? So what is it? <laughs> 350 right now. OK, thank you. All right. So this is what I think the different uh, factors are. Let's see, the policies that humans emit, how these emissions translate. Oh, the other one was natural variability. OK, I don't know if you noticed this, but weather is really variable, by the way, OK? And so it, it depends on what scale you're talking about. There, there could be quite a bit of natural variability in there. So that's the other part that we didn't talk about already. All right, so when we start thinking about what's going to happen in the future, the first thing we start with is just saying, well, 
what's going to happen to humans. You know, what are humans going to do? So we, um, for the last IPCC, a uh, group of people put together a set of scenarios, just saying, well, what if population goes up by this? And you know, everybody's really nice to each other, and they share, and we try to cut CO2. OK, that's one scenario. That's going to be our low scenario. And what if everybody competes and emits like crazy? That's another scenario. So this uh, particular paper describes all the future scenarios. So these aren't really predictions. We don't usually refer to them as predictions. We refer to them as projections, like if this happened, what would happen? Just so we can kind of get a sense of what might happen to the world at 2100 or 2200. It's a long ways out. We're not trying to predict it really. We're just, we call it a projection. If this happens, this is what's going to happen. So that's what the IPCC is about. It's not about policy prescriptions. It's about analyzing what might happen if this happened. So there are all sorts of assumptions. We have to assume population, GDP. You know, I don't want you to, to um, get caught up on the details. But there's a lot of uh, guesses we have to make about what might happen and what the relationships are between population and carbon emissions. And um, so they use, in some ways, kind of simple models and in some ways fairly uh, sophisticated models, uh, integrated assessment models, to decide what might happen going into the future. Um, and from that, from all this, we, we get these different emission scenarios for CO2 then, and CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide. And so we have these ideas of what might happen going into the future. Once we have the idea of what might happen going into the future, then there's this issue of trying to figure out how those emissions translate into radiative forcings in the atmosphere. And um, this slide, which, which comes from the chapter one, which was the, the one I was the lead author on that we put together, is trying to capture some of these processes that, you know, actually the emissions occur as CO2, but about half the CO2 is left in the atmosphere and the other half is taken up by the land and the ocean. And um, a lot of times we just assume that's going to continue to happen into the future, but it turns out it probably won't, that as there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere, it starts accumulating, the land and the ocean are probably going to be less able to take up that CO2. And, and in fact, there's people estimate somewhere between 20 and 35 percent of the CO2 that we're emitting right now is still going to be in the atmosphere in 20,000 years. I, I think Professor Hess showed you some slides about that. So there's some feedbacks and some uncertainty in those feedbacks because they have to do with what the land and the ocean are going to do in the meantime. And again, we're, we're, we're planning on hitting, you know, if we go with business as usual CO2 emissions, it's a lot of CO2 we're going to put in the atmosphere, and it's hard to know exactly what's going to happen to all that CO2, as well as the other gases and aerosols. Um, but one, one um, important point to make is actually that, well, maybe this isn't the easiest to see here, but if we say we're here at, at, at 20, this is oh, 2005 is really what this is. But if we, we think of ourselves, you know, 2017, and we're trying to make decisions about uh, what we want climate to maybe be uh, later in the future, it turns out um, the difference between these, these really radically different scenarios here, which I, I called the RCP 8.5 is business as usual, and it's pretty much what we were on until the Paris agreements. Um, and maybe we went down to RCP 6.0, the next lowest one um, at that point, if people actually go through with what they said they would do, which, of course, it's doubtful that the US will, but some of the other countries. But, uh, but this, this lowest one, this RCP 2.6, it's called, this scenario is, is a radical scenario, and it's the only way to keep us below 2 degrees. But pretty much for this particular scenario, everybody has to be a vegan. Corn ethanol has to work wonderfully. Okay, we have to be able to shove all the corn ethanol biofuel into the ground, geologic sequestration, without any induced seismicity or loss of CO2 back out. Okay, um, and there's some other questionable assumptions. Okay, that's the only way in, the, in, that, in that scenario that we can get to the, the really lower bounds. Now, there's, there's other ways that people have come up with, but it's really, it's a radical change in the whole way, the whole economy, of the whole world works, OK? So let's just say RCP 2.6 is becoming less and less likely every day, OK? And leave it uh, kind of at that. But, but the, the important thing to notice is actually if you go out to 2030 or 2050, the temperature change between business as usual, let's just emit like crazy, 
and between let's radically rework our entire economy is really small. Basically, today we're making decisions about what climate change we're going to see in 2100, 2200, 2300. We've already mostly made up our minds about what's going to happen by 2050, okay? And so this is an important point that I think people sometimes don't get. And it might be a little bit easier to see in this slide, where, which was prepared in the chapter one of the last IPCC. And um, if you look out here at, at 2030, these are the different estimates of what the climate change will be from the, the last IPCC or these IPCC, and they all overlay out to 2030, okay? We have already decided the climate out to 2030 in a lot of ways and out to 2050. We're just starting to decide what's going to happen at 2100 or 2200. That, that's what um, sometimes people don't understand, is the, is the time scale of the climate change problem is really what the issue is. Um, and why is it that, that I'm, I'm telling you that it, you know, we're making the decisions now that will impact us later. Well, it has to do with, for example, the very long time scale of CO2 in the atmosphere that we've already talked about. But in addition to that, the long time scale of infrastructure, okay? We put in a coal-fired power plant. We're spending billions of dollars on that coal-fired power plant, and it better last for 50, 75 years. That's why we put it in. We're, we're not going to take it out of commission, okay? That, that would be a waste of money. And so then you're going to keep burning this, the, the um, coal and produce the CO2 for the next 50 to 75 years. So there's a climate change commitment in the infrastructure, OK? So we have to stop building coal-fired power plants and start putting in solar facilities and wind facilities now to stop future emissions, OK? And so you put in a coal-fired power plant. You just committed yourself basically for emitting for the next 50 to 75 years. And then that CO2 stays in the atmosphere for a really long time, OK? So this, this problem is a really long time scale problem. And I think it's very hard for people to understand that time scale. Any questions on that or what I've said so far? What do we got here? All right. So coming back to our problem of, of uncertainties, we. Um, uh, Professor has showed you this, this one uh, last time and, and just showed this is a standard radiative forcing plot, what the constituents are that are forcing climate. And um, right now, it's, it's mostly CO2, but there's a little bit of offsetting from aerosols and quite a bit of uncertainty because of the aerosol forcing, right? The, the error bars here, we, we don't know exactly what aerosols are doing. And, um, and that, if we translate that into probability density functions, how many people think in probability density functions here? How many people don't have any clue what they're talking about there? All right, so I won't go very far there. But, um, but they're really powerful, and you should learn about them. And basically, what they're saying is just, you know, what's, what's one standard deviation of our knowledge you, you could think of? And, and that's what's plotted up here is uh, we, for example, we think the aerosols are cooling the planet, but actually, they could be slightly warming the planet. That's, there's a percent chance that they're slightly warming the planet here, um, or that they're cooling the planet by one watt per meter squared instead of a half, OK? So we don't know exactly. We can use a probability density function or a standard deviation to describe how big that error is. So for CO2, it's pretty well known, you know, line by line what it's doing um, in, at all different wavelengths. But for aerosols, there's so many different kinds of aerosols, and some are black, and some are clear, and some interact with. Um, clouds. There's a lot of uncertainty to that, and that's expressed here in the in the error bars here. So although the CO2 is is dominating the warming right now, and in the future will dominate even more, in terms of the uncertainty, the aerosols are dominating the uncertainty. Okay, and that's where a lot of the uncertainty is. Um, and then um, uh, let me skip that one. And then we can estimate then some kind of radiative forcing, some kind of imbalance in the energy is what radiative forcing is and how much it warms. And again, we're going from 1850, 2000, and then out to 2100 here and farther. And here's our business as usual. And here's our let's radically rework the entire world society. And you can see you know, the radiative forcing is really similar, out, oh, 2030 at least. Um, it, it's later that, that things get more different. 
And that's the radiative forcings. But then if we think about the climate response here using these climate models, we get a lot more spread than in the temperature down, down here. And um, so th there's more spread than, than even just in our calculations of radiative forcing. And this is partly in the way that, that the IPCC constructed these is why there's so much uncertainty spread here. And the, the reason are because of the many feedbacks in the climate system. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the feedbacks in the climate system. So again, this is from the chapter one that we, that we worked on. Um, and there are multiple positive and negative uh, feedbacks in the, in the Earth system. When we put this extra CO2 into the atmosphere and we get a little bit of warming, but actually we, in the net we expect more warming than you would have just expected from that CO2. And the reason is, is we think that the positive feedbacks will dominate over the negative feedback. So if I talk about a positive feedback, for example, water vapor. What's the most important greenhouse gas on the planet right now, natural or anthropogenic? It's water vapor, okay? Water vapor is really what's keeping the face of the planet livable here, okay? And um, we're emitting all this CO2 and it raises the temperature a little bit and it makes it so the atmosphere can hold more water vapor. And this positive feedback then makes it so there's more greenhouse gases because of the water vapor in addition to the CO2. So that's a pretty strong positive feedback that occurs. In addition, there's another nice one, a snow albedo, snow ice albedo one, which I think um, you could see from this slide, which again was shown last time. Um, when we just think about the energy budget, you know, the incoming solar radiation, a good part of that incoming solar radiation is actually reflected back out. Okay, and it's reflected back out by white surfaces. And if you change how much snow you have, for example, if you melt the snow because the planet's warmer, you will reflect back out less of the incoming solar radiation. So that is a positive feedback. So the snow albedo feedback is one of the reasons we think that there's going to be more warming, say, in high latitudes, especially in the northern high latitudes. Um, Clouds are really very complicated and they're really, really important for the climate system as well as for us humans in terms of that's where we get our precipitation from. Um, but clouds are very complicated because they're those white things that reflect back out the incoming solar radiation. But they're also really strong um, uh, um, long wave absorbers. So they act like super greenhouse gases, in fact, when they're in there. So it's a really complicated interaction. And, and for climate models, this is actually where a lot of the variability in the climate projection comes from, is how they think the clouds are going to respond in the future. Um, because if you get high clouds, they'll have a different response than low clouds. And it just depends where you're putting the clouds and what the feedbacks are. So in terms of our understanding, if we could figure out what kind of clouds we're going to have in the future, that would improve our ability to make projections. All right, in addition, um, you can think about uh, some of the uncertainty in, in climate response coming from our uncertainty in, in what's forcing our climate change that we're seeing right now. Um, so here, again, I'm showing you a probability density function. I'm really sorry. Um, but what you just want to look at is how wide this is, because that's basically your standard deviation in your error. And it, this is called your transient climate response. So how much is the climate going to respond, OK? and um, to, to a given uh, change in the radiative budget. And we have a certain amount of uncertainty in, in how much the climate's going to respond. And it turns out that in, in a lot of ways you can think of this coming either from you know, the uncertainty in how the clouds will respond in the climate models, or in uh, what, what happened with the aerosols. And the aeros we don't know how much the aerosols have changed our um, radiative forcing or change the energy budget at the top of the atmosphere because we only have one planet, right? This is our problem. If we had like 50 planets, we could figure it all out. We only have one planet and we happen to be changing the CO2 and the aerosols at the same time. So it's hard to pull apart the different pieces. And, um, and so we know pretty well our observed temperature change and um, the temperature anomaly here with time. We know pretty well what that is. That's, that's fairly well known. But we divide it by this uncertainty in the radiative forcing. And it's about 1.5 watts per meter squared, but we have some standard deviation there. And we get then this climate response 
that we think has happened, but now we're going to multiply that by 10 times that in the future. If we keep emitting the way we're emitting right now, we're going to get these radiative forcings up to 10 watts per meter squared or something. Right now we got 1.6, okay? And so that means, you know, we got a little bit of uncertainty here and we're just totally going to crank on the system in the future when we've only seen a little bit of it so far. And that's where our uncertainty is in, in the climate projections. That, um, that at 2100, we don't know if we're going to get a, what, a one degree increase in surface temperature or a four or five degree increase in surface temperature with the same CO2 in the atmosphere. We're just not sure. And, and that's because we've never hit the system this hard um, before. And so we'll, we'll have to find out. Um, the, the other thing I want to talk a little bit about is, is this whole natural variability issue. And, um, and then, so uh, a lot of the um, people who don't want to um, invest much in climate mitigation would argue, for example, uh, in, in at least up to 2013 when this report came out, would argue that you know, since 2000, temperature hasn't really risen. So maybe climate change is over. Okay. But, um, and so it's called a hiatus in some terminology. And um, so there were, wasn't a temperature increase then. There was a big temperature increase, say, across the 80s, 1980s into the 90s, and then it kind of flattened out. But if you look longer term uh, up here on this temperature slide, you'll see that actually that happens a lot, that the, that the temperature will go up, and then it'll flatten, and then it'll go up again, and it'll flatten. Um, there's other things going on on this planet than just anthropogenic climate change. I mean, we're, we're perturbing things, um, but that's not all that happens. There are natural variability, uh, there's natural variability in the climate system, and we, we see that in all this ups and downs, the interannual variability and in things. The other interesting thing that um, seemed to happen, I'm sorry, in... Um, and uh, since 1998, which was a really big El Nino year, and, um, and so that always raises the temperatures up a lot. It was like a super El Nino that year. Um, and, and the reason why we think that there hasn't really been that big of an increase in temperature until uh, 2015 and 2016 um, was because, you know, it, it was so uh, such a big increase in 1998 relative to previously. And so then it, it was kind of flat for a while. And um, if you look, actually, the ocean heat data set suggests that there was still in the ocean an accumulation of warmth going into the ocean. And um, sea level kept rising, which again is an indicator that there was um, warmth going into the ocean. Because the ocean, the water expands just a little bit whenever it gets warmer, but there's a lot of water. Okay, so then you see, can see some sea level rise. Um, and um, so what that gives us, let's see, um, what that gives us then, it, it would be consistent with more heat going into the oceans as being responsible for why we, don't, we didn't see the surface temperatures rising because all the heat was going into the oceans there for a few years. But in addition to that, I, I don't know how much you guys have heard of, of chaos theory or um, it, it was really hot when I was young, the whole idea that you could have deterministic equations, but nonlinear, and it meant that you didn't know what the answer was going to be. It, even, even though they were deterministic, it depended so much on the initial conditions. And it turns out that Ed Lorenz, um, who was at MIT, um, discovered chaos, as they called it, along with people in other fields, and they all kind of discovered it at the same time, and it became a, a big issue. And the, the whole idea is uh, that you have complex nonlinear equations, and they're characterized by chaotic behavior. Um, and so small differences in initial conditions yield divergent outcomes. Um, and uh, the fluid dynamical equations that are relevant for weather are, are definitely um, uh, nonlinear dynamical equations. And what it means is kind of, to some extent, intuitively obvious to all of us is that um, weather uh, can be very difficult to predict, and yet, the climate is, is fairly predictable in a lot of ways. Like, we know in Ithaca it's going to be cold in the winter, usually, you know, warmer in the summer, but it's, it's warmer other places, right? Climate is what you expect. Weather is what you get, is what people say. And it can be difficult to predict weather too many days out, say, in the range from a few days to 
and they're seasonal to um, year-long timescales in many cases. And the reason is, is because it's a complex dynamical equation and there's all this variability going on and all these complications going on. Um, and so this, this comes from the IPCC and the idea is for weather predictions, there's an initial value problem. It means the initial condition of the atmosphere really, really matters and we, we just can't observe it that closely. And with time, I mean, you know, don't, by the way, okay, maybe I'm, I'm popping your bubble here, but believe meteorological forecasts for the first couple days and then start decreasing how much you believe them at a week or two week. It's really just climatology. I'm telling you this as a meteorologist, don't believe it, okay? But um, once you get to the, to the climate, to more than a decade or so, and you're hitting the system hard, like we are right now, with all these changes in CO2, you can start believing the climate predictions at that point. Not the weather that, that is predicted, but the climate predictions, because you're forcing the system into such a change, okay? And so it's really difficult to make predictions in the week to a month, season, year, even up to the decadal prediction, because there's so much variability. There's so much natural variability. And if we could, we would be predicting these things because of course the farmers have wanted to know for thousands of years when they should plant, okay, and when they should harvest. And there have been soothsayers trying to make, you know, trying to make money off of answering this question for years. But, um, it, so one of the things that meteorologists have to do is, is tell people is that, no, we, we can't do all of that that you want us to do. Just because we have big computers and we know a lot, there, there are limits to predictability. And a lot of the predictability in this kind of range is just really, really difficult to do. Now, there's some conditions we can do pretty well. If there's an El Nino, for example, it controls a lot of the, the weather and the climate in certain parts of the world. Or the um, NAO is in a certain phase. So there's some things we can do. But a, a lot of the questions that people have for meteorologists is, is we, we can't do that. Okay, It's too small scale. It's too short of a time scale. But climate, when you hit the system with 10 watts per meter squared, we, we actually can do that problem pretty well, okay? So the, there's a little bit of a, um, a mixing up of the weather problem versus the climate problem in the, in the community. And so if we think about this hiatus problem, I mean, people want us to explain why temperatures didn't go up all the time uh, over that whole time period. Well, first of all, there, there's probably an ocean atmosphere oscillation where the heat went deeper into the ocean to, over that time period. And this is the kind of thing we expect from the, um, from the, uh, the climate system. And it was funny because the, the climate people didn't even look at this problem for years. You know, the climate skeptics were off, you know, writing all these papers about it, but the climate people are like, duh, this is what happens. You know, you've got these 10 year cycles. Why are you interpreting it? It's not climate. Climate is 30 years. Um, so it took a while for the climate community to kind of get on top of it and start talking about and articulating, you know, what is climate, that, that's a 30-year mean, versus weather and natural variability that, you know, we, we don't try to predict with a climate model, you know, or, you know, these days actually people are doing a better job at that kind of prediction, but it's a very tough problem. So, and then of course, you know, what came out then is the last two years, have had these huge increases in, in, in temperatures. With the, we have the hottest um, temperatures on record. So it's just like what the climate people thought is fine. For 10 years, nothing will happen. This happens all the time. And then it'll start going up again. It's, it's just an um, ocean atmosphere system responding to the whole problem. So then if we think about what are the dominant sources of you know, uncertainty in climate or what, what's going to happen going into the future, this comes from the um, frequently asked questions in chapter one that, that I was uh, um, a part of, of putting together. And it, I think it's a fundamental question we all have is, you know, we, uh, we understand so much about the climate system. How come we don't know for sure what's going to happen at any, particular, um, uh, at any particular time in the future? And, and so the way to think about it here, here we start in the 1960s and go to 2010, and then out into the 2100 in the future. And these are decadal mean temperatures. So they're not quite the climate time period. It really should be a 30-year mean to get climate. But we have the observations and the observed variability. And then we have kind of this yellow region that's just natural variability. I mean, it's weather, OK? That's what it is. It's going to vary. We, we know that. There's going to be a certain amount of just natural variability. And then there's a certain amount, uh, this blue area is that climate response uncertainty because 
because we've only hit the system just a little bit, 1.5 watts per meter squared at this point. And in the future, we're going to hit it with 10. And so we're, we're extrapolating. And so there's a certain amount of error because we don't know that climate response. And then there's this emission uncertainty. You know, and at first, it's pretty small because, like we said before, right now we're deciding what's going to happen after 2050 and 2100 and later. We've kind of already decided with the infrastructure we put in, the CO2 we already have in the atmosphere, it's pretty much decided what's going to happen to 2030 to 2050. Um, and so the emission uncertainty, you know, it's, it's fairly small up to 2050, and then it, it starts to dominate once you get out to 2100. So the choices we make become more and more important as we get farther out, okay? Now, a really important point is that the smaller the time period or the smaller the spatial scale, the more natural variability matters and the, and the harder it is to make predictions. And of course, that's the, that's the scale that we care about. I mean, I want to know what's happening in Ithaca, right? You know, I want to know what, when to plant my garden in Ithaca. I have to make those decisions. Well, um, it, it turns out, you know, if we start with the, the kind of plot that we, we just showed, if you look at you know, how much uncertainty there is in, say, uncertainty in global mean annual temperatures here. You know, it's, there's interannual variability is orange. The green is the which scenario, and the blue is the model spread. But if you go down to Europe here, you see the interannual variability chunk of that increases. And then you go into precipitation, for example. You want to know wintertime precipitation. That interannual variability gets more and more important, okay? So in some ways, the smaller the scale and the, um, you know, so the more relevant for an individual person, the harder it is because then weather starts dominating so much. And, and just to, related to that is the, the impact of climate change on individual events, which we're going to have later on in the semester, um, some experts on this coming and talking about. Um, and we, we expect climate change to increase heat spells and decrease cold as well, right? You increase the mean temperature, that's what's going to happen. Um, it, it should also make precipitation more extreme. And, and I think the Carrie Emanuel will talk about that. And of course, the more you heat the oceans, sea level goes up. And that means the surge um, is going to go up. So storm surge goes up. Um, and, and in the news, extreme events like storms or droughts, that's, that's where weather really hits people a lot of the time, right? with the infrastructure in between them. Um, but it's really hard to blame an individual event on climate change. And yet, that's where we think climate change will have the biggest impacts on people, OK? So it's a real, I find it a, a real problem. How do you communicate that effectively? And you know in the media, there's, there's always ineffective communication, right? It's, um, the scientists will say, well, it'll increase the odds of blah, blah happening. And the media will say, you know, the sole cause of that event was climate change, okay? And, uh, but how do you, you know, how do you make sure that you attribute it to climate change without, you know, scientifically accurately, with, without, you know, someone diluting it or exaggerating it? And I, I think this is a real problem, trying to make sure that this is communicated effectively. So scientists usually do this carefully, and they, they do an attribution. Say, for that particular storm, there's a 30, we estimate there's a 30% increase that, and the probability that that type of storm would occur. So that's what often they do. So if we go back to our question, you know, what are the causes of the large range? Um, and then there's uh, quite a bit of uncertainty in the short term, and we talked about the natural variability there. A and then we come to, um, I guess, a, a little bit away from what I do, but, but I feel like um, people misinterpret uncertainty. And, um, do the uncertainties in climate projections really stop policy from being made? So policymakers and every other thing that they have to make policy, they know exactly what's going to happen. No, <laughs> that's ridiculous. We actually know much better uh, you know, what the temperature changes might be with different scenarios of CO2 than most of the policies that, that people are thinking about. So uh, um, that's just an excuse that they, they use, right? They're just saying, it's not going to win me any election or any votes in the next election to do what you want me to do. So I'm going to claim there's too much uncertainty. I mean, so that, that's all they're saying, right? It's just one of those words that, that politicians say. I mean, you compare it to like the federal regulation on banks. They want to pull back all the 
the um, regulations that they put in after the 2007 crisis, right? I, you know, how does anybody know what, how that's going to impact uh, the world? Uh, tax rates, healthcare changes. These things are, are even more uncertain than climate change. So that's not really what's holding back climate change legislation. Um, and what it, what the, what's holding it back is, of course, the, the costs have to be paid for now, right, is what they're thinking of. Costs of mitigation have to be paid for now. And the impacts will be seen maybe in 2050, 2100. And these guys are going to be dead, right? They're not even up for election anymore, OK? So this is the problem with climate change, is that the impacts are so far down. And, and you know, it's a, a tragedy of the commons that's intergenerational. Um, and so then for any politicians, for them to try to think on the 50-year time scale is really hard. You have to make it kind of today for them to care about. And that's one of the differences. Like in the, U in the European Union, they are not fossil fuel producers like we are. So for their energy security, they can get co-benefits for converting to sustainable energy. Or in China, they get co-benefits from getting off of coal because there's such bad air pollution. In the United States, it's a different situation. There's quite a bit of money to be made in fossil fuels. So we have to be aware of um, these kind of arguments. And the, the uncertainty in the projections are not what is uh, making it so that we don't have policy. But there are, there's quite a bit of uncertainty about climate change. And um, the, you know, we're just talking here about temperatures, for example. But the impacts, we, we don't know uh, as well as we might want to know. And, and again, it's because it's, it, it's gonna, we're going to hit the system pretty hard. So we don't know exactly what the consequences are going to be. Um, so I guess I just want to reiterate, you know, we, we are certain that there is anthropogenic climate change, as certain as we can be without having multiple planets. Um, and uh, the future is going to be warmer. There's going to be changes in precipitation, more extremes in precipitation. We haven't really talked about these here, but you'll see them later in the semester. Um, but uh, there, there are uncertainties in the future projections, but this, this is what's driving not having policy on them. It's, it, I, I would argue it's probably this bigger time scale issue that's a, that's a more important issue. And the, the costs. If we had more sustainable energies to put in right away, we would probably be doing uh, more. And, and actually, that's what happened with the Paris Agreement. It was all of a sudden there were these new technologies and, that were available. And so people started moving forward on things. So I guess uh, maybe I'm a little bit pessimistic in some ways about climate change policy and making agreements, and yet optimistic that um, things are moving in the right direction here with the, with the Paris Agreement. And hopefully, we'll keep moving in that direction. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.